it. Thank you to Don Mills Collegiate for opening their school up so we can do this presentation to help get the rookies off the ground and running really quickly. You guys are all new to first, but one thing you're going to learn very quickly in first is as much as it's a competition, teams are really willing to help each other out. And that's why we're doing this thing today, because we want the rookies to get off the ground, moving quickly and on their way towards a successful season. What this drivetrain consists of is some of the components in the kit, as well as some additional components. We call it the kit bot on steroids. You could build the standard kit bot, and you would have a drivetrain that I would say would be at a 70% level at, at the competition, better than 70% of the teams. If you do the kit bot on steroids, you'll bring yourself to the 90-95% point. Last year, with this sort of kit bot, it would have easily, in what we determined, probably been the fourth best drivetrain in all of Canada. This is easy stuff. It's very simple to do. It's inexpensive because we know, you know, money issues are tough with this sort of thing. And we're going to give you full instructions. We're gonna so put a video we're going to get internet. started on this stuff. I'm Karthik. Uh, this is Todd Willock, mechanical engineer, mentor on Team 1114, who's been designing first drivetrains years after years. He's kind of the pioneer of the simple drivetrain and first in Canada. And we're going to talk about what we can do and why we're going with principles of simplicity. So, Todd, you want to say something? Actually, I don't even think you need to cut length. Uh, yeah, they come with oh, do, do they? Okay. Yes. <laughs> ah, well. So there's guidance lines telling you exactly where to cut. The attachment pieces are these little blocks of aluminum here. You plop them in, you add some screws in. You go all right through it. Now this is a fairly solid frame in terms of durability. It's not, never going to fall apart on you, but it's lacking in one key area, which people don't seem to realize with it. It's not very rigid. So what we're going to do to it we're going to screw in a piece of three quarter inch plywood now. Simple piece of plywood, that's it. Nothing fancy here. We use wood on our robots. We use a lot of wood on our robots. Yeah, it's cheap. We're all about keeping it simple and using the simplest and cheapest tool that does the job well. There's no reason to overcomplicate. The principles of simplicity are what we're going to stress here today. In a lot of, a lot of uh, directions, plywood will have a much better strength to weight ratio than any metal that you can afford. Now the standard kit bot, when they, that comes, you know, that they talk about in the manual, they go with a four-wheel drive configuration with pretty slick wheels. So the kit bot on steroid, we've taken it a little bit further because when you go with pretty slick wheels, it makes it very easy to turn. That's a good thing, but you don't have very much traction, meaning you're very susceptible to being pushed. So what we've done is we've got some custom wheels. There's two companies out there in Canada that sell really good wheels, Andy Mark and Innovation First, and they have all sorts of wheels online that you can buy and then you can put this custom rubber tread on which gives you a lot more traction. It's really good stuff if used properly. If we use a four-wheel drive configuration with the high traction wheels, there is a problem. It becomes difficult to turn. ...about turning on a robot with skid steer or any skid steer in general is in order to flip a wheel sideways, you generate more power going forwards than it takes to slide that wheel sideways. So the way we deal with that sort of thing is because with four-wheel drive configuration, you've got a very long wheelbase, very difficult to turn. Put two, two wheels in the middle for a six-wheel drive configuration. Doesn't change anything until you offset the center wheels, drop them by about an eighth of an inch, which this kit frame is designed with one hole lower so you can lower that center wheel. So what happens then? You're always going to be resting only on four wheels, but four wheels with a much more compact drive base. So suddenly, it's very easy to turn. You don't lose stability because the rock is only one-eighth of an inch. You're not going to tip over because of the shorter drive base. But now you can turn with, while maintaining very high traction. And it's actually not even that it rocks. It's because we drive on carpet. The, the other four wheels actually all kind of touch, but they have a lot less, uh, lot less force on them, a lot less normal load. So to slide them sideways doesn't require the power. So a six-wheel will, will turn nicely. And it won't overturn like a, something with casters will. It's the easiest to drive robot that you'll ever make. It's easy to build. And it's been, throughout history, the most successful type of drive training. In 2007, there was one rookie team, um, Team 2056, who you'll hear a lot about this year. And they decided they were only just going to use the kit frame. They kind of went with the kit frame on steroids. And that year, a lot of people were like, oh, well, it's just a boring kit frame. How well could they do? They ended up winning both regionals in Canada. Because they've stuck with the principles of simplicity. Get them started. Start putting it together. Now these are, we're part, part of the parts here. The kit frame comes with, it may still come with some really 
in the wrong spot, it's bolts and you can use a zap. It doesn't come with six of them, so you need some extra three eight bolts. Um, Those. Andy Mark has good wheels, these plastic wheels like that, usually in the 20 to 30 to 40 dollar range. Innovation First has similar wheels like that, made out of sheet metal, that are pretty good prices. This year, when you're thinking about this year's game, we've all seen the game now. We've had a couple minutes to take a look through things. It's a wide open field, so going at a high speed is very important. If you were to use the standard kit transmission, again, they haven't gotten to assembling these yet. These are the transmissions that come in your kit. You should use them. Building a custom transmission is three weeks of work and usually not worth the effort. The standard kit transmission is very, there, very You'll effective. see some robots out there this year who may be going 15 feet per second, but they're going to be doing that with a custom two-speed transmission. It's something if you really want to go for, go for it. But we always say build simple, build within your means. We don't build our own transmissions. We have the ability to, but it's really not worth your time. If you can buy something that's better than what we can do, and you can buy it from the same place that does these single speeds is where we buy our two speed transmissions. So the two websites you want to look at for this stuff, andymark.biz and vexrobotics.com. If you want to get a little more advanced, it's, it's a good idea to understand how the two speeds work. What we do is we actually buy them, take them apart, and kind of reassemble them into a smaller form factor most of the time. So we don't use them exactly as they come because they're a little heavy. But what you're seeing right now is just a bunch of high school kids tossing this frame together, super easy, a and Beckett, who's their mentor, who I and the basic gist of this whole thing is, you're not using complicated tools, you're not using complicated machines, it's being done in a cafeteria. And it's really important to use properly sized spacers on your drivetrain because that keeps everything aligned. If you have chains which are going a little bit cockeyed and off on angles, you drastically reduce the, the efficiency of your drivetrain. As such, you're not getting the full power out of your motors, you're not, and you're basically wasting you know, the power that you have a in your A lot battery. of times teams will build robots, and these robots go through a huge amount of vibration during a match. They basically shake themselves silly, and no matter how tight you make a bolt, it can shake itself loose, unless you lock tight your bolts. Thread locker is a great thing. Put it together, make sure it's right the way you want it, then start pulling bolts out one by one, apply some thread locker, and put it back but in. But just really and forget important, the it. biggest lesson we want everyone to get out of this is, the kit frame is your friend. A lot of teams think, oh, well, it came in the kit. How good could it be? We want to do something custom. We want to do something special. You need to understand that this kit frame was designed by an engineer who was one of the world championship on his own first team. The transmissions were designed by two engineers who have won world championships on their own first teams. These are not sub-rate parts that they're giving you. You pay that big registration fee, so you get these really good things in your kit. And if and you're you doing any calculations, you're probably going to want to put your mu at a 1.2 or a 1.3. Yeah. I mean, always, always do it within safety. If you're trying to figure out if your breaker is going to trip, then calculate your mu at 1.4. Assume there's too much friction, so you'll gear a bit differently. But I think it is a very reasonable goal for every team in this room to have a moving drivetrain by the end of the second week. And the best thing is, because after the first couple weeks, if you don't get a moving drivetrain, um, the attention of the team kind of wanes. The excitement kind of dies down because they haven't seen anything happen. The first time you guys get a robot moving, you're going to feel so freaking awesome. It is just the best feeling, a sense of accomplishment of, whoa, this group of 20 kids here who'd never done anything with robotics before in their life have built an industrial level One great thing is, robot. there's redundancy here. You blow a chain, you don't lose the entire side of the drivetrain. If you blow one chain, you still have wheels going. Because you, as soon as you blow a side of the drivetrain, you become completely ineffective for the whole match. Obviously, you want to design your drivetrain such that chains don't blow, but it is something that happens. And if you just blow this chain right here, you've still got five wheels going. You're still going to be able to drive. It's going to be a little bit tougher on your driver, but you're still going to be functional. Each other. Please, when you put it together, fill it with grease. Fill it with grease. If you don't grease those gearboxes, you will run it for one hour, and your gears will have disintegrated system, the heart of your robot. It starts off with your National Instrument serial brick. When you're wiring stuff with this, be very, very careful with what you're doing. We like to use quick disconnects everywhere, so if something fails, you can replace, pull stuff out. 
we like to use thicker wire than recommended. The reason why we like to do that is the thicker the wire, the more current. Speed controllers. Have flow There's two types it. of speed controllers in your kit. There's the Jaguar speed controller. It is larger. It takes up more room, and it's heavier, but it, it is cheaper than the Victor. The Victor is a higher performance speed controller, and has 99.99% success rate. It's a very, very good speed controller. I'm a little bit biased. I work for the company that makes the Victor. But the Victor is more expensive. If budget is a concern, um, then maybe go with the Jaguar. Always make sure everything on your control system is very accessible. So if you need to make changes, it can be done easily. Label all your wires. So if something's not working, you know where to find the wire. You know where to trace it Velcro to. Velcro is your best friend. We Velcro our battery down. We Velcro our Victors down. Because number one, the bond of Velcro is so, so tight. Your on-off switch. You need to have your on-off switch somewhere where it's accessible. wrong with the robot and, heaven forbid, a little bit of an electrical fire. You need to be able to get at that very easily without having to reach through the mess. Normally, I don't like to talk too much about safety, but this is an actual safety issue. P keep that accessible. Have a sign beside it so anyone can find it. Have it be able to turn off. Your battery. What they always do with these connectors is they zip. Even though the connector is a pretty solid connector, you put a zip tie right as Q-Tip's doing right here to keep that together. You'd never want that connector to come out during a match, otherwise you're not moving anymore and you are now useless. So now one thing about this test right now, it's very cool that we're doing very cool that we're doing this on a cafeteria floor. We're doing something very, very wrong. What are we doing wrong right now? Some test on carpet because the competition is not on a cafeteria floor. Too often teams will test on a classroom floor, they're pumped, like our robot turns, it's awesome! They go to the event, they put it on the carpet. Why doesn't it turn? Another thing when you're doing your early testing, you build the drivetrain, you want to test to see how it's doing, but you haven't built the other 70 pounds of your robot. Put 70 pounds of stuff on the robot drivetrain just to test it, to see how it's going to react to that extra weight. So another principle to always think about is you want to keep your weight super low. And that's one thing about this whole kit bar configuration. Everything is down low. This bait pl base plate adds extra weight down at the bottom, the axles. If you keep your weight down low, your turning is going to be better and you're going to be much less likely to tip over. Think about when you're going to score this year on some of those pegs which are pretty high off the ground. You are lifting a weight and you're now extending it outside of your robot frame. Depending on where your center of gravity is, you could put yourself in a position where you can tip over. So if you keep your center of gravity low and over the center of your wheelbase, the chances of tipping are heavily minimized. What we like to say in first is the jack of all trades is the master of none. There are a bunch of different things you can do in this year's game. Say that everything you could do could be rated on a scale of 1 to 10, and you're walking into the robot store with about $30 worth of stuff to buy these things at 1 to 10. You always want to rather have three things at 10 out of 10 than five things at 6 out of 10. You don't want to be consistently average. You'd rather be great in a limited subset of things. Remember, three robots on the field, you have partners that can work with you to cover the whole gamut. You, it's so important. And this is not even just a robotics lesson. This is a life lesson. Every one of you rookie teams has been paired with a mentor team. Talk to your mentor team. They're there to help you. They are absolutely there to help you. 